least OBS is like, hey, you're back. So let's just make sure. <clears throat> uh, yep. All right, we should be good. All right. <clears throat> so I mean, we just skipped the loading screen. That doesn't matter. But okay. So back to where we were. <sighs> the finale of the game. So I did make a locker where I put everything that we needed in there. It wasn't this one. Was it the cell one? No. Shit. Which one did I put it in? Oh no. Rocket, here we go. <laughs> the rocket locker. Okay, so here's a bunch of stuff that we needed. So if we look at our mm, blueprints here. Let's see. Um, okay, so if we look at the blueprints and we go down to. Did I pass that already? Fuck, where was it? Uh, oh, here it is. Okay, the fuel reserve. So we need plasteel and get crystalline sulfur times four. Four kyanite and then ion power cells. Now, on my way back from uh, the prawn suit visit at the temple, where we left everything, where we left the crystalline sulfur in our backpack, um, I was able to find like a bunch of uh, titanium. I, I found a bunch of like just slag, and I turned it all into titanium. And we should have a bunch. I don't remember what locker I stuffed it all in. It might have been this one. Yeah, so we have more than enough titanium. So that should be 10. And now let's go ahead and get some lithium. We need one, like two. <clears throat> and make some plasteel. <clears throat> First the titanium ingot. And then the plasteel ingot. <clears throat> Then we just take the four kyanite, and then the four of the other things, and that's it. So, kyanite, we take four. One, two, three, four. One. One, two, three, four. And the two ion power cells, so that should be it. Yep. Alright. Let's go build the rest of the rocket. Is it daylight? It is not. I'll go to sleep, Welcome just so that we can see it all be built. <clears throat> okay, let's go back out. And on to our giant rocket platform. Go. Look at this thing. It's so big. Can you scan it? <laughs> okay. The fuel reserve. Look at this thing. It's so huge. It is outrageously big. It's like the size of the Aurora. And it's all for us. Like, no one else. Just us. Aren't we special? I mean, technically, this was supposed to be for, like, the six or seven people that crashed on the Aurora. Alright. What's next? So, the Cyclops Shield Generator, Plasteo Ingot, Enameled Glass, and Computer Chip. So, I did make something similar to that. Um, I made this. I thought that's what we needed. I think we need that for the Cyclops. Uh, let's see. Shield generator. Let's see if I can find it somewhere here. Oh, no. We just need other things. What am I doing? Um. Okay. So... Alright, let's do it. Get a chip which I don't want to make. We should have plenty for all this. <laughs> One cool thing about um, Subnautica Below Zero is that it lets you pin recipes and it shows you like what you need for everything. Like you can have it there in the top corner and it's like, oh, you need this, this, and this. Alright, so let's make some more plasteel, like usual. Not the wrong one. Hmm. 
go. And then the 10 titanium. steel ingot. Let's make the enameled glass, of which I have a fuck ton of, like, glass on me. Well, I have a bunch of quartz, but we also already had glass, so let's just make that. So there's the enameled glass. I know we need a power cell. I don't remember if we have one on us, or if we left it. I think we left it behind. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have one in our person, so we're gonna have to make another one, which... Shouldn't be too hard. Um, and that's all we need, right? We need that and then the Cyclops shield generator. Oh, no, no, no. We don't need the parcel. What am I talking about? That was for the fuel reserves. Um, but we do need the power cell for the shield generator, right? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to need to make two computer chips, aren't we? To make this thing. Okay, so we need... God damn. Okay, so we're going to need four copper, two gold, and four table coral. So we should have enough of that. So, let's see. Here's two copper. Here's three of this. We need one more. I should have a bunch, though. Uh, I know I just, like, shoved a, a bunch of it in one locker as soon as we got back. So it's one of these that's got it. Uh, not this one. Nope. Don't tell me I have to go look for more copper. Otherwise, I know there's copper inside of the prawn suit. Uh, uh. God damn it. Okay, well, let's make one, one thing at least. So let's get the two silver out. And then we'll easily get some more copper. I could have sworn we had everything already. Now I feel... Like a hippomacrit. Alright, the wiring kit. We need gold. Was it three gold total? And we're gonna need we're gonna need more gold actually. And good thing I got some more deep shrooms. I knew we were gonna fucking need them. Yeah, we need two more of those. So two more gold. Uh three with the computer chip One, two three and then well we've got enough shrooms though oh boy computer chip and now the advanced wiring kit so we got one of them <sighs> now we have to make another one okay well let's get the shrooms first so we can make hydrochloric acid and then the salt deposit, so that should be in this one. We need two of those. Good thing I fucking called it. I was like, we'll probably need six. <laughs> and I was fucking right. Okay. Uh, the shield generator. And that was... Yep. That and a power cell. Okay. <clears throat> so, we mix those with salt... And then it was with gold. So let's get the salt out of one of these. <clears throat> Just get a bunch. And then we need gold. Just get a bunch as well. Okay. Alright, hydrochloric acid. <clears throat> Some more. And now the polyaniline. Alright. So now we could make the Cyclops shield generator thing. And get that out of the way. And then we'd still need to make another advanced wiring kit for the rest of this. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry, that's what the advanced wiring kit was for. Uh, then we still need a computer chip. Okay. So, let's make the power cell, which is what, a battery and silicone rubber? I believe so. And a battery was acid shrooms and what? And copper. 
God damn it. Um, I'm pretty sure we had a bunch left over on the back of the prawn, but I don't think we should call the way for that. It's like five minutes away. Vital signs stabilizing. Um, so let's put this stuff away here, at least in the locker space. Oh, we do have a battery, actually. What am I doing? We've got two. Oh, Richard, what the fuck are you doing, man? Alright. <laughs> I guess I'm still a little tired after work. But that's okay. We still need the fucking copper, though. For the rest of what we need. So right now we can go ahead and make the shield generator we've got everything we need for this and then we just need the computer chip and that should be it right yep <sighs> god i hate 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 making this thing so much but okay let's get this out of the way and this. so now we can go ahead and combine those Did I not make it here? Is it in here? Oh, don't tell me I have to fabricate it inside of the Cyclops. Don't fucking tell me that. Here. Where is it at? Show me. Vehicle upgrades. Scanner room upgrades. Cyclops up. Oh. Okay. Well, look. We have to go to the Cyclops anyways. So might as well, right? We'll take it. We'll take everything we need from it. Good thing this thing isn't too, too far away. But fuck, it's so far away. Um, you know what? The prawn suit's closer. I guess we'll just stop there real quick. Should have dropped the salt when I was at it. Let's do that now real quick. Just drop the salt. We really don't need the salt on this. Um, we'll go to the prawn suit. We'll collect some table coral. We'll pick up what we need from the back of the prawn suit. And... Hopefully it should be enough copper. Hopefully I don't need to make any more fucking computer chips. And we should have enough titanium no matter what though. I went and scavenged for quite a bit. Okay. Oh, oh. Alright, that should be more than enough. I brought the things with me, right? Yes, I did. Let me just make sure that I'm not being facetious. Yeah, 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 okay. Okay. Now, we did turn the Cyclops off, meaning that it shouldn't have been using the batteries in the meantime. However, knowing this game, we don't know. Also, um, the Prontude got stuck in the temple when uh, we last left it after i reloaded i was able to get back in and then just move around so i don't know why it doesn't again subnautica is still kind of glitchy sometimes but don't let that uh deter you from the fun that it provides and the terrors that it brings because but again before the before the game is over we'll go ahead and explore the uncharted waters we'll go through the forbidden zones and look at some of the giant creatures that lurk about that will give you the nightmares i was gonna say the heebie-jeebies but that sounded dumb uh, they'll give you nightmares no matter what okay so the prawn suit's in there and then unit 01 is like right next to it anyways it's a little further down whoa, 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 whoa. it's crashed okay where is the entrance to the moon pool? <clears throat> and there we go. 
us. The prawn suit's right in front of us. Huh. Please tell me I did choose copper. And don't make me regret coming here. Get you moving, boy. Welcome aboard, Captain. Okay, that's not what I meant to do. I meant to get on your back. One copper. <laughs> God fucking damn it. Well, let's take everything else out. Alright, uh, we could technically take the prawn suit all the way to Unit 01 and then store it, but who cares? Prawn suit, you... You did your work. Let's go. This was supposed to be a quick, a quick segment. Just bada bing, bada boom. Come in, come out. That's it. But that's uh, Subnautica in a nutshell. Do I have enough of this? The game. Oh yeah, the lights are on. And we can't see anything. <laughs> Can you imagine this? Traversing through the dark waters of the ocean. Your lights are on, and all you can see are the bubbles in front of you. And maybe some of the bioluminescent fishes in front of you as well. And nothing else. Because whatever is below you is so deep that you can't see it. Like here we see our light reflecting on the rocks, right? But if they weren't here, this is all you see. Just darkness in front of you. And that's, uh, fucking terrifying. <laughs> Because there's still technically leviathans around here. Okay, we're almost there. Unit 01 is right in front of us. Oh, we can actually shove the sea moth in here. Can we? How much power do we do you have? 97. Alright, cool. Somehow, it's glitched into thinking it's working. Not this way. Yeah, okay, cool. Shield generator. Let's go. Um, we could take the Cyclops back. Before I even consider doing so. We're going to check our lockers here. Storage, what do we have in these? Besides food and water. Power cells, we should take those just in case. Uh, that one's empty. And this one has metal salvage. Other than that. Let's go. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> and back to base we go. Hmm. <clears throat> no, that won't work. Um. I was like, we could probably go through the warp and then just appear near our base, but I'm like, no, that's stupid. That's only gonna put us near Gun Island. Of all things. But either way, back through the deep, dark waters we traverse. Yeah, I don't think we can, I don't think we're missing anything. Alright, we should be fine. We need like one piece of copper now. <laughs> Again, with a completed chip. I'll try uh, spelunking on the little cave systems near near our base. There's a bunch of uh, limestone outcrops on there that we can try getting. That camera has drifted a lot more. Wait, no, no, no. Uh, I thought it was a thousand. I thought our base was a thousand meters, but that's the uh, the life pod or the escape pod. I mean. <clears throat> And the sun's coming out. 
That looks beautiful, though. Like, the way the water is, like, just moving. So nice. But still very fucking freaky. <laughs> Alright, let's get going. And see what else we can find. Again, if we can just find some limestone, limestone outcrops here, we can try to pick those up. Um, are those some of them? Yeah, no. And uh, oh wait, there's some here. Okay, we need like one piece of copper. There is one, just in case, fucking anything happens. There's titanium. Any more, perhaps? You know, just just in case. You know, the bio. So nice. This is the one with the giant jelly, uh, like mushrooms. Or is it something else? I don't think we ever came down here. No, it's just a different area. Neat. So this could have been a cool place for a base. Titanium again. We don't need that. A copper. Okay, that's an extra one. Any more? Still. Copper. Okay. So that's four extra copper. Or four copper total. Just in case. Now let's get back. Let's wrap things up. So before liftoff, we'll just get in the Seamoth, and we'll pick a direction, and we'll just drive in that direction. And we're eventually going to get stopped by something. Because, of course, the game doesn't want you to, you know, explore certain areas. You know, the game, the little sandbox ends after a little while. And that's understandable. And the way they choose to keep you within the boundaries is frightening. But we'll be, we'll be seeing that for sure in a little bit. I don't think we need any more acid shrooms. We should be fine on those. <clears throat> All right. Home sweet home. Also, apparently, before you get on the rocket, you can actually say goodbye to your, your little cuttlefish. Which is cute. Welcome aboard, Captain. Alright. <clears throat> Let's make all the other things I hate making. Titanium first. And then the copper wire. Okay, and we're gonna need a wiring kit, right? No, just a piece of gold. Right. And yep, computer chip. <clears throat> Alright, we should have everything now. Just double check. The plasteel ingot's the last thing we need. Okay. Well, that's easy. The lithium locker. Let's get two out. Let's go ahead and store this in here, just for the hell of it. Okay. <clears throat> so we need four more titanium, of which again we have plenty. One, two, three, four, and fabricating uh, the plasteel ingot. <clears throat> and plasteel. Alright, and we're good. Right? Yes, we are. Okay. Uh, 
I thought this, like, platform disappeared for a second, and I was scared for a moment. Thinking, no way. I don't want to have to do all that again. Save real quick. Hmm. <clears throat> and, okay. Let's construct it. Let's just, uh... Ah, uh, we can't- we can't take the elevator up there. We were too slow. But it's being built. It's being built. And... Neptune 1 rocket. Online. And it's done. Our rocket is done! You know what, since it's got white and yellow color schemes, <clears throat> this will be the prototype unit. Zero, zero. So I should say that somewhere on the side, instead of Neptune. Hmm. But now we have... Oh yeah, it says it, it says it right there. We have our giant fucking rocket. <clears throat> so now we can take, I think, the elevator inside and then just leave. If we want to. Let me save first. And then right now it's probably going to be like, you're going to need to power this thing even though you already did. With the fuel reserves. <clears throat> We're so high up. It's so frightening. Look, you can see everything. The aurora and everything. Auxiliary power units. So from what I know, we're supposed to just activate a bunch of stuff in here. And then we're supposed to go up to the cockpit. And then actually take off. Because it'll tell you what you need. So life support systems, uh, the primary computer. You don't really need the time capsule. I'm probably not even going to use it. We need the communications array, hydraulic systems, and auxiliary power unit. So I think it was five out of six that we need to have. So we can activate all this stuff now, and then, you know, leave. But before we do, let's do, well, like I mentioned, let's look at some of the scary things that we're not supposed to see. That the game's like, nope. Now, any human doing that would have probably broken a few bones after just splashing from that high of a distance. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Just leave everything else in here. Okay, so before we do, let me take one of these batteries out. And charge this one. Okay, <clears throat> so now let's really save. And let's go and explore <clears throat> some of the uh, areas I never wanted to visit. <laughs> So, if you've been here from the start, you probably remember that at the very beginning we tried finding Gun Island, we didn't know where it was, and while searching I accidentally went a little too far, let's say, and because of that, we got hit by something. Something smacked us while we were in the Seamoth, and it sent us flying through the air a few meters, and then we landed like this into the water while it fucking chased us and roared at us and I have no idea what it was we got like a glimpse of it and that's it and now we're gonna do something similar to that and it's gonna be freaky deaky all right here it goes so <clears throat> I know that near the Aurora especially like by the boosters there's a bunch of Reaper Leviathans 
Not just by the boosters in this area here, but also near the front. There's just a bunch, like, on the other side of it. <clears throat> Why, I don't know. But we're gonna be exploring. Here a little bit. So let's get closer to the rocket boosters first. So here we are. You can hear the music changing. So once you go like past these rocks basically is when uh you know. You know. So let's explore and see what we encounter. There's a Reaper Leviathan. That's not the that's not the scary thing. The scary thing is what's after this, and now I'm a little Oh. Okay. Can you get off me, please? Oh my god. Oh, where'd it go? You motherfucker. Leave my unit 02 alone, dude. Let's repair you. So close to being destroyed. Can you shag off? Oh, you motherfucker, you destroyed my little submarine. How fucking dare you? Get your ass back here. We should have built a stasis rifle just to contain this asshole. Get your ass back here. Stop your roaring. I'm getting revenge. I don't care what the fuck I do. I wanted to show off scary boys and here you are roaring and destroying my fucking sub and all my life's work. Oh, and now you're running away. you more. Ah, he ate us. Man. Well, either way, that's not the scary boy. I thought we could honestly get away from it, so we're gonna have to load that, so I'm just gonna quit. And then reload it, and then we're just gonna head out again. <clears throat> its roar is like the only scary thing about the Reaper Leviathan, because it throws you off if you're not, you know, expecting it. And if, but if it's in the vicinity and you just hear that and you have no idea what the fuck it is, it's pretty, you know, frightening to a certain extent. Let's go back out. <clears throat> so we'll head on over that way one more time. And then afterwards, we'll head on over to Gun Island. And once you go past, like, the edge of Gun Island, that's when we start seeing some ghosts. So here, we kind of just have to go this way, just straight ahead. So we're just going to do that. We're going to eventually run face-to-face -to, -face to a giant thing, more than likely. And when that happens, we're all going to get scared. But that's okay. Because we won't see it coming, and all of a sudden we're going to have a giant creature... ...here before us. Mm. But um, if we head back over to, like I said, to Gun Island, and we just start going down... ...we're eventually going to encounter giant predators. Giant transparent predators. And it's probably like the giant ghost leviathans. So, let's keep going. Ah oh man, this is already kind of like freaky. Oh boy. <clears throat> it's 
probably going to be below us. We'll see. <clears throat> oh boy, my heart is like pounding. I'm actually like kind of scared. I have no idea. What oh, there it is. Oh. Oh. Okay. Never mind. Wait, are you violent? No. Okay, never mind. Huh, I guess because we rescued, or it's probably one of the babies that grew up. Maybe? I don't want to look below us. Uh, <laughs> this is fucking frightening, man. Uh, how far away are we from base? Um, <sighs> I think I was grabbing this. Okay, so we're about a thousand meters away, so maybe we can still keep going. Let's just see what happens, right? <laughs> I hate the sensation, this like anxiety that's like running through me because something might pop up right now and just, you know. Okay, I think it's around this. Okay. Okay, you hear it. You hear it. Oh, it is a giant ghost leviathan, you motherfucker. Is that the only thing here? No, let's keep going. We can outrun it. I was expecting something worse. Let's do evasive maneuvers. Okay. Um, I think that's it, more than likely. I'm pretty sure it was just the Ghost of Ithan, so never mind. Uh, I, had ne I had never actually seen this far out here. We're about 3,000. Yeah, we're about 3,000 meters away from base. So it's honestly more than likely just the Ghost Leviathan then. <clears throat> so never mind. I guess I built that up for for nothing. Um, right, then let's just get out of here, I guess. Let's wrap up Subnautica for now. I guess uh, it was the, you know, the Emperor... Or, um, you know, the big boy that we just saw at first. Maybe that's, like, the first wave that kicks you out or something? I'm not sure. I was usually never, uh, ballsy enough to actually go out there. At least before. Um, so I guess before we do leave, let's see what we have. Mm -hmm. So, this is something that I, I don't think we read on stream, but... This is the thing that I mentioned. We would see the peepers coming in and out of the facility, but when they were leaving, they were taking some of the enzyme with them, enzyme 42. So that's how um, some of the ocean remained stable while other parts, you know, became infected. So it helped out a little bit. And we have the hatching enzymes. Uh, the specimen's eggs are attached to some form of incubator. In the normal life cycle, it seems that the sea emperor would have buried their eggs in shallow waters, where different organic materials in the soil would have triggered a hatching response. The incubator suggests the aliens had resorted to developing artificial hatching enzymes, which would simulate the egg's natural hatching environments, but were unable to discover the formula. With extensive information on the sea emperors themselves, it may still be possible to fabricate an artificial hatching enzyme using indigenous ingredients. However, the only surviving source of that information may be the sea emperor itself. 
<clears throat> so again, peepers coming in and out. The eggs <clears throat> of the sea emperor. Uncommonly strong shell lining. Organic growth on the exterior suggests that these eggs may be hundreds of thousands of years old. Alien devices penetrate the outer shell, uh, shell layer, likely designed to supply them with nutrients and to isolate them from the surrounding environment. Like many eggs on the planet, these do not contain a nutrient supply which is slowly exhausted by the embryo. Instead, they exist in a form of natural stasis, awaiting appropriate hatching conditions. Fetal organism. There is a high genetic match between these organic these organisms and the leviathan in the vicinity, they appear to be unstable and healthy. It is likely that hatching, that the ideal hatching conditions for the eggs vary considerably from ideal survival conditions for the parents. And then the sea emperor's life cycle. Available biological data has been used to synthesize the effects of the alien bacterium on the sea emperor's natural life cycle. The creature likely lived and moved in small herds around the planet's ocean trenches, coming to the surface to feed off of huge volumes of microorganisms in the shallower waters. Family size would be strictly limited by the availability or the available food supply. Offspring would likely split off at a young age to form their own herd elsewhere. Given their sparse population, mating and egg laying was likely infrequent, perhaps a once in a lifetime event. The species that likely had preferred environment for laying for egg laying in Oh, the species likely had a preferred environment for egg laying. In fact, su successful hatching may depend on such conditions. Given the rarity of this event, it is impossible to calculate these conditions pre precisely. Yeah, I don't blame you. There is no evidence to support the assumption that all members of the species were immune from the alien bacterium. Even if this is so, there is evidence that the introduction of the bacterium decimated life on the planet, and this would have had catastrophic effects on the Emperor's food supply and survival rate. So that's more than likely what happened. I, I kind of agree with the last portion of... Because there was, again, an apocalyptic event on the planet. Most of the food kind of died. And with it dying, well, your population starts to go as well. Especially if it happened, you know, thousands of years ago. The symbiotic relationship between the specimen and other life forms are likely developed as a direct result of the bacterial infection. Those life forms which learned to keep the emperor alive survived with its help. This may explain the vast tracts of lifeless ocean in a rough perimeter around the emperor's location. That's true. Some data downloads that we got. What else? <clears throat> An aquarium arch. Oh yeah, scans indicated this arch was left inactive when the facility was abandoned. It likely served as an access point to the surface of the planet. It is much too small for the Emperor to pass through, but would accommodate smaller life forms. And the last thing that we got, ventilation controls. So, water flowing to and from the primary containment facility is being automatically controlled, independent of the other safeguards. Data on the water composition has been recorded. Inflow. Water is being drawn from different biomes around the surface of the planet. The water temperature is considerably lower than the volcanic environment outside the facility, while microorganisms and nutrient counts are substantially higher. Outflow. Oxygen-deprived water is being flooded from the system and recycled back to the surface. Now, we did scan... The lava lizard? <laughs> Not that. Um, oh, here's the information if you want to pause it and read it um, in the future. But I want to focus just on the Sea Emperor Juvenile. Because they're the little boys. Look at them. A Juvenile Emperor specimen. It is producing a highly potent form of Enzyme 42, which should be capable of fully curing individuals of the alien bacterium. The species hatch is relatively fully formed and independent, perhaps reflecting the fact that they must fend for themselves when they are first born away from their parents. The specimen is healthy and exhibiting signs of positive attitude to life. So that's pretty cute. Uh, the last thing I did want to look at was this thing. A rock grub. It was a tiny little grub that I found while uh, getting some minerals. A small luminescent scavenger, roughly thumb size. So yeah, this thing was tiny. I could barely see it. This creature may be a distant relative of the sand shark, sharing the species' unusual limbs, segmented exoskeleton, and burrowing behavior. It looks a lot like a little grubbin from Pogemans. So it's got a jaw. Its circular set of teeth is designed to tear up clumps of coral and seagrass caught on the rocks. <clears throat> Five legs, two arms, and a large flipper allow the rock grub to cling to and walk across rock faces in search of food, and swiftly swim uh, to safety when under attack. Green luminescence. Glowing green in the dark would seem like a poor survival strategy, but this adaptation may be a mating behavior or other specialized process, engaged in only by a fraction of the total population at any one time. Or perhaps being eaten is simply part of the rock grub's life cycle. 
assessment are harmless. And they're really cute. Excluding the, you know, violent rows of teeth. They're tiny little, little grubs. But alright. That's basically it here for Subnautica. Let's go ahead and save one last time. And let's get on the rocket and prepare to leave. In the morning, that is. <clears throat> okay. So, finale time. Right and early. <clears throat> Let's call the elevator. I was like, what if we just stand underneath it as it comes down? You know. Just to, like, upset OSHA a little bit. And their standards. Or regulations. Okay. Back in we go. I'm pretty sure we don't need to bring any food with us. It'd be smart to bring water and stuff with us. If we're, a you know, canonically, like, if we were actually leaving. That would be the smart thing. So, communications array. Communications systems array active. Hydraulic systems. Pressurizing hydraulics. Auxiliary power. Auxiliary power unit online. Life support. Hmm. Life support systems online. And the primary computer. Primary computer systems active. Now, one thing you can do is you can always All leave systems are go for lift off. a time capsule. And normally what you do is you leave some stuff inside of this to help other players in the future. So, for example, we can leave an image, a message, and we can store something in it. We could leave, like, that, for example, and that'll help another player out or something. We can leave the thermal blade. You know, just a survival package or something. And then go back. And, I don't know, man. Happy hunting. <laughs> That's the only image we have. Yeah, fuck it. Alright, it's ready. So. That's it, I guess. Time capsule ready. So, that's been prepared. So, this, as far as I know, you... As soon as you leave, you drop the time capsule. And then this will be given to... Just any random, like a random player that's also playing, they might fi find it uh, somewhere in the depths here. And that's pretty neat. But now, let's get ready to leave. Ready to launch on your command, Captain. Launch in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Time capsule jettison. Caution. 
approaching orbital debris field. Well, not again. Orbital debris oh. field clear. Performing gravity turn maneuver. Confirm destination coordinates. Nearest interstellar phase gate. Engaging ion boosters in three, two, one. What is a wave without the ocean, a beginning without an end? They are different, but they go together. Now you go among the stars, and I fall among the sand. We are different, but we go together. Aww. How sweet of her. That's Subnautica. What a what a wild ride this was. Honestly. The game itself was just really, really good. Um yeah, the music is also really fucking great. I don't think there's much to say uh, anymore, I mean, about the game. I did talk a lot about it, and I praised it a lot of times. There are a few things that did bug me here and there, but they're mainly, you know, my fault, the whole, you know, fi lack of resources in certain times, that sort of deal. Um, <clears throat> you're supposed to explore in this game, that's the whole, you know, point of it. But it was a lot of fun. It was so much fun playing this. And now I kind of like, I kind of want to go through Below Zero, but we'll probably wait on that one before we start it. That might happen more around winter. Unless we finish Shin Megami Tensei 3 first. If we finish uh, Nocturne right away, then sure. Uh, if we don't, then, you know, we'll probably play it later. Because <clears throat> Nocturne is, um, well, we're going to start in a little bit once the credits are over and everything. And... That's a long ass game. But for now, I'll go ahead and just mute myself for a little bit. <clears throat> and I'll be back with you in a moment. <clears throat> Welcome home to all Terra. Permission to land will be granted once you have settled your outstanding balance of one trillion credits. Oh. So even in the end, huh? <laughs> what a... What the fuck? <laughs> Oh god. Okay. <clears throat> so, let me swap screens here real quick. We're gonna be doing a BRB for a little bit. <clears throat> Just while I get a Nocturne set up. So, here, give me a second. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm gonna do real quick is...
I'll go ahead and just stop the stream and then start it right away. But this time under um, the Shin Megami Tensei like uh, section. That way it, it kind of counted as two. So <clears throat> for those of you who just wanted to stick for or stick around for the Subnautica uh, ending, I hope you did enjoy yourselves. We are going to be starting <clears throat> a really interesting RPG next, though. <clears throat> oh God, hold on. Which is uh, Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne. Now, it's one of my most favorite RPGs out there. It's got a very unique atmosphere to it. It's very interesting. And it's very, very, very hard. I'll explain a lot more about Nocturne in a little bit. <clears throat> uh, once I actually just do the split here for this. And then... <clears throat> Uh, we'll get started. But if you are interested in a unique RPG with some really dark tones, uh, mainly, again, the apocalypse, uh, and, uh, well, how humanity kind of deals with a lot of horrific things, then do stick around uh, for that. Now, before we do swap on over, I did want to quickly read a short story to completely end off Subnautica, <clears throat> and I I, re I referenced this now uh, this uh, short story a few times uh, throughout the stream, uh, but it's called the Temple, and it's by H. P. Lovecraft. It is basically about a German soldier who is in a U boat, and he run you know he's kind of just running on power, and he's looking around and exploring this temple that he finds right. So <clears throat> it's all written in, in a manuscript that he sends out uh, in a bottle to shore, and it washes up in the coast of Yucatan in Mexico. So, <clears throat> let me see if I should get something in the background. Um, yeah, you know what? I'll just have some instrumentals here in the background while I read this. <clears throat> so, let's do... Oh, you know what? Yeah. Let's do... Let's do Smanky Kong here. Mm. Okay, so let me lower it a tiny bit more. Yeah, there we go. Mm. Okay. So. <clears throat> the Temple. By H.P. Lovecraft. Manuscript found on the coast of Yucatan. On August 20th, 1917, I, Karl Heinrich Graf von Altberg, Ehrenstein, Lieutenant Commander in the Imperial German Navy and in charge of the submarine U-29, deposit this bottle and record in the Atlantic and record in the Atlantic Ocean at a point to me unknown, but probably about north latitude 20 degrees, west lat longitude 35 degrees, where my ship lies disabled on the ocean floor. I do so because of my desire to set certain unusual facts before the public. A thing I shall not in all probability survive to accomplish in person, since the circumstances surrounding me are as menacing as they are extraordinary, and involve not only the hopeless crippling of the U-29, but the impairment of my own iron German will in a manner most disastrous. On the afternoon of June 18th, as reported by wireless to the U-61 bound for Kyle, we torpedoed the British freighter Victory, New York to Liverpool, in north latitude 45 degrees 16, west longitude 28 degrees 34, permitting the crew to leave in boats in order to obtain a good cinema view for the Admiralty records. The ship sank quite picturesquely, bow first, then stern, the stern rising high out of the water, whilst the hull shut down perpendicularly to the bottom of the sea. Our camera missed nothing, and I regret that so fine a reel of film should never reach Berlin. After that, we sank the lifeboats with our gun, guns and submerged. When we rose to the surface, about a sunset, about sunset, a seaman's body was found on deck, hands grippling or gripping the rail in, cur in a curious fashion. The poor fellow was young, rather dark and very handsome, probably Italian or Greek, and undoubtedly of the Victory's crew. He had evidently sought refuge on the very ship which had been forced to destroy his own. One more victim of the unjust war. 
<clears throat> of aggression which the English pig dogs are waging upon the fatherland. Uh, this is after World War One, by the way. Or during World War One, one of those two. Our men searched him for souvenirs and found in his coat pocket a very odd bit of ivory carved to represent a youth's head crowned with laurel. My fellow officer, Lieutenant Clenza, believed that the thing was of great age and artistic value, so took it from the men for himself. How it had ever come into the possession of a common sailor, neither he nor I could imagine. As the dead man was thrown overboard, there occurred two incidents, which created much disturbance amongst the crew. The fellow's eyes had been closed, but in the dragging of his body to the rail where they, they were jarred open, and many seemed to entertain a queer delusion that they, that they gazed steadily and mockingly at Schmidt and Zimmer, who were bent over the corpse. The boatswain, Müller, an elderly man who would, have, who would have known better had he not been superstitious, <clears throat> Alsatian swine, became, became so, much, so excited by, the imp by this impression that he watched the body in the water and swore that after it sank a little, it drew its limbs into a swimming position and sped away to the south under the waves. Cleanse and I did not like these displays of peasant ignorance, and severely reprimanded the men, particularly Mueller. The next day, a very troublesome situation was created by the disposition of some of the crew. They were evidently suffering from the nervous strains of a long voyage, and had had bad dreams. Several seemed quite dazed and stupid. But after satisfying myself that they were not feigning their weakness, I excused them from their duties. The sea was rather rough, so we descended to a depth where the waves were less troublesome. Here we were comparatively calm, despite a somewhat puzzling southward current which we could not identify from our oceano ocean oceanographic <clears throat> charts. The moans of the sick man were decidedly annoying, but since they did not appear to demoralize the rest of the crew, <clears throat> we did not resort to extreme measures. It was our plan to remain where we were and intercept the liner, Dacia, mentioned in the information <clears throat> from agents in New York. In the early evening, we rose to the surface and found the, sea, found the sea less heavy. The smoke of a battleship was in the northern horizon, but our distance and ability to submerge made us safe. What worried us more was the talk of Boatswain Müller, which grew wilder as night came on. He was in, detestably, in a detestably childish state, and babbled off some illusion of dead bodies drifting past the undersea portholes, bodies which looked at him intensely, and which he recognized in spite of bloating and having seen... Yeah, and bloating is having seen dying during some of our vicious, uh, victorious German exploits. And he said that the young man we found and tossed overboard was their leader. This was very gruesome and abnormal. So we confined Mueller in irons and had him soundly whipped. The men were not pleased at his punishment, but discipline was necessary. We also denied the request of a delegation headed by Seaman Zima that the curious carved ivory head to be cast into the sea. On June 20th, Seaman Bohm and Schmidt, who had been ill the day before, became violently insane. I regretted that no physician was included in our complete in our completement of officers, since German lives are precious, but the constant ravings of the two concerning a terrible curse were most submersive of discipline. So drastic steps were taken. The crew accepted the event in a sullen fashion, but it seemed to quiet Müller, who thereafter gave us no trouble. In the evening we released him, and he went about his duty silently. In the week that followed, we were all very nervous, watching for the Dacia. The tension was aggravated by the disappearance of Müller and, and Zima, who undoubtedly committed suicide as a result of the fears which had been to harass them, though they were not observed in the act of jumping overboard. I was rather glad to be rid of Müller, for, his, for even his silence had unfavorably affected the crew. Everyone seemed inclined to be silent now, as though holding a secret fear. Many were ill, but none made a disturbance. Lieutenant Clenza chaffed under the strain and was annoyed by the merest trifles, such as the school of dolphins which gathered about the U-29 increasing in numbers, and the growing intensity of that southward current which was not on our chart. It at length became apparent that we had dismissed the Dacia altogether. Such failures are not uncommon, and we were more pleased than disappointed, 
since our return to Wilhelmshaven was now in order. At noon, June 28th, we turned northeastward. And despite some rather comical entanglements with the unusual masses of dolphins, we're soon underway. <clears throat> the explosion at the engine room at 2 p.m. was wholly, was wholly a surprise. <clears throat> Sorry, was wholly a surprise. No defect in the machinery or carelessness in the men that in, in the men had been noticed. Yet without warning, the ship was racked from end to end with a colossal shock. Lieutenant Clenza hurried to the engine room, finding the fuel tank and most of the mechanisms shattered. And engineers Rabe and, Schne and Schneider instantly killed. Our situation had suddenly become grave indeed. For though the chemical air regenerators were intact, and though we could use the devices for raising and submerging the ship and opening the hatches as long <clears throat> as compressed air and storage batteries might hold out, we were powerless to propel or guide the submarine. To seek rescue in the lifeboats would be to deliver ourselves into the hands of enemies, unreasonably embittered against our great German nation, and our wireless had failed ever since the victory affair put us in touch with, the, with a fellow U-boat of the Imperial Navy. <clears throat> From the hour of the incident till July 2nd, we drifted constantly to the south, almost without plans and encountering no vessel. Dolphins still encircled the U-29, a somewhat remarkable circumstance considering the distance we had covered. On the morning of July 2nd, we sighted a warship flying American colors, and the men became very re restless in their desire to surrender. Finally, Lieutenant Clenza had to shoot a seaman named Taube, who urged his un-German who urged this un-German act with special with a special violence. This quieted the crew for the time, and we submerged unseen. The next afternoon, a dense flock of seabirds appeared from the south, and the ocean began to heave ominously. Closing our hatches, we awaited development until we realized that we must either submerge or be swamped in the mounting waves. Our air pressure and electricity were diminishing, and we wished to avoid all unnecessary use of our slender mechanical resources. But in this case, we had no choice. We did not descend far, and <clears throat> when after several hours the sea was calmer, we decided to return to the surface. Here, however, a new trouble developed, for the ship failed to respond to our direction in spite of all the mechanics could do. As the men grew more frightened at this undersea imprisonment, some of them began to murder again, mutter again about Lieutenant Cleanse's ivory image, but the sight of an automatic pistol calmed them. We kept the poor devils as busy as we could, tinkering at the machinery even when we knew it was useless. <clears throat> Cleanse and I slept at different times. It was during my sleep about 5am July 4th that the general mutiny broke loose. The six remaining pigs of seamen suspecting that we were lost, had suddenly burst into a mad fury at our refusal to, sur to surrender at the Yankee battleship two days before, and were in a delirium of cursing and destruction. They roared like animal, like the animals they were, and broke instruments and furniture indiscriminately, screaming about such nonsense as the curse of the ivory image, and the dark, dead youth who looked at them and swam away. Lieutenant Cleanses seemed paralyzed and inefficient, as one might expect of a soft, womanish, Heinlander. I shot all six men, for it was unnecessary, for it was necessary, and made sure that none remained alive. We expelled the bodies through the double hatches and were alone on the U-29. Cleanser seemed very nervous and drank heavily. It was decided that we remain alive as long as possible, using the large stock of provisions and chemical supply of oxygen, none of which had suffered from the crazy antics <clears throat> of those swine hound seamen. Our compasses, death gauges, and other delicate instruments were ruined, so that henceforth our only reckoning would be guesswork. Based on our watches, <clears throat> the calendar, and our apparent drift, as judged by any object we might spy through the portholes, or from the con conning tower. Fortunately, we had storage batteries still capable of long use, both for the interior lighting and for the searchlights. We often cast a beam around the ship, but saw only dolphins swimming parallel to our drifting course. I was scientifically interested in these dolphins, for though ordinary del Delphinus Delphis, it is a cetacean mammal, unable to subsist without air. I watched one of the swimmers closely for two hours and I not, did not see him alter his submerged condition. With the passage of time, Cleanse and I decided that we were still drifting south, meanwhile sinking deeper and deeper. 
We noted the marine fauna and flora and read much on the subject of books that I had carried with me for spare moments. I could not help observing. However, the inferior scientific knowledge of my companion, his mind was not Prussian, but given, well, Prussian, but given to imaginings and speculations which have no value. The fact our death affected him, the fact our coming death affected him curiously, and he would frequently pray in remorse over the men and women and children he had sent to the bottom, <clears throat> forgetting that all things are noble which serve the German state. After a time, he became noticeably unbalanced, gazing for hours at his ivory image and weaving fanciful stories of the lost and forgotten things under the sea. Sometimes at a psychological experiment, exper as a psychological experiment, I would lead him in on these wonderings and listen to his endless poetical quotations of tales of sunken ships. I was very sorry for him, for I disliked to see a German suffer. But he was not a good man to die, uh, to die with. For myself, I was proud, knowing how the fatherland would revere my memory and how my sons would be taught to be men like me. We're almost there. <clears throat> On August 9, we espied the ocean floor and sent a powerful beam from the searchlight over it. It was a vast, undulating plain, mostly covered with seaweed and strewn, and strewn with shells of small mollusks. <clears throat> Here and there were slimy objects of puzzling contour, draped with weeds and encrusted with barnacles, which Cleansa declared must be the ancient ships lying in their graves. He was puzzled by one thing. A peak of solid matter protruding above the ocean bed nearly four feet at its apex, about two feet thick, with flat sides and smooth upper surfaces which met at a very obtuse angle. I called the peak a bit of outcropping rock, but Cleansa thought he saw carvings on it. After a while he began to shudder, and turned away from the scenes as if frightened, yet could give no explanation save that he was overcome with vastness, darkness, remoteness, antiquity, and mystery of the oceanic abysses. His mind was tired, but I'm always a German and was quick to notice two things. The U-29 was standing the, was standing the deep sea pressure splendidly, and that the peculiar dolphins were still about us even at a depth where existence of high organisms is considered impossible by most naturalists. <clears throat> I mean, I already lost. Okay, there we go. That I had previously overestimated our depth. I was sure, but nonetheless, we we must still be deep enough to make the, these phenomena remarkable. Our southward speed, as gauged by the ocean floor, was about as I had estimated from the organisms passed at higher levels. It was 3.15 p.m. August 12th that poor Cleanse went wholly mad. He had been in the conning tower. <clears throat> conning or coning? I'd be coning. Uh, coning tower using the searchlight when I saw him bound into the library compartment where I sat reading and his face at once betrayed him. I will repeat here what he said, underlining the words that he emphasized. <clears throat> he is calling. He is calling. I hear him. We must go. As he spoke, he took his ivory image from the, tab from the table, pocketed it, and seized my arm in an effort to drag me up to the companionway to the deck. Uh, up the companionway to the deck. In a moment, I understood that he meant to open the hatch and plunge with me into the water outside, a vagary of suicidal homicide hom and homicidal mania, for which I was scarcely prepared. As I hung back and attempted to soothe him, he grew more violent, saying, Come on now, or come now, do not wait until later. It is better to repent and be forgiven than to defy and be condemned. Then, I tried the opposite of the soothing plan and told him he was mad pitifully demented. But he was unmoved and cried, If I'm mad, it is mercy. May the gods pity the man who is in his callousness can remain sane to the hideous end. Come and be mad whilst he still calls for mercy. The outburst seemed to relieve a pressure in his brain. For as he finished, he grew much milder, asking me to let him depart alone if I would not accompany him. My course at once became clear. He was a German, but only a Heinlander and a commoner, and he was now a potentially dangerous madman. By complying with the suicidal request, I could immediately free myself from <clears throat> one who was no longer a companion, but a menace. I asked him to give me the ivory image before he went, but the request brought from him such uncanny laughter that, he, that I did not repeat it. 
Then I asked him if he wished to leave any keepsake or lock of hair for his family in Germany in case I should be rescued. But again, he gave me a strange laugh. So as he climbed the ladder and went to the levers, <clears throat> and allowing proper time intervals operated the machinery which sent him to his death. <clears throat> After I saw that he was no longer in the boat, I threw the searchlight around the water in an effort to obtain a last glimpse of him, since I wished to ascertain the water pressure would flatten him, as it theoretically should, or whether the body would be unaffected, like those extraordinary dolphins. I did not, however, succeed in finding my late companion, for the dolphins were mass were massed thickly and obscuringly ar about the co conning tower or coning tower, whichever it is. <clears throat> Hold on. Oh no. What was I? There we go. <clears throat> That evening, I regretted that I had not taken the ivory image surreptitiously from poor Cleanse's pocket as he left, for the memory of it fascinated me. I could not forget the youthful, beautiful head with its leafy crown. Though I am not by nature an artist, I was also sorry that I had no, that had no one with whom to converse. Cleanse, though not my mental equal, was much better than no one. I did not sleep well that night and wondered exactly what, uh, when the end would come. Surely, I had little enough chance of rescue. The next day, I ascended to the co uh, coding tower and commenced the customary searchlight uh, sighted, uh, sighted the bottom, or searchlight expl explorations. Uh, northward, the view was much the same as it had been for the past four days since we had sighted the bottom, but I perceived that the drifting of the U-29 was less rapid. As I swung the beam around to the south, I noticed the ocean floor ahead and fell away <clears throat> in a marked uh, declivity and bore curiously regular blocks of stone in certain places, disposed as if, uh, as if in accordance <clears throat> with definite patterns. The boat did not once descend to match the greater ocean depths, so I was soon forced to adjust the searchlight to cast sharply downward a sharply downward beam. Owing to the abruptness <clears throat> of the change, a wire was disconnected, which necessitated a delay of many minutes for repairs, but at length the light streamed on again, flooding the marine valley below me. I am not given to emotion of any kind, but my amazement was very great when I saw what lay revealed in the electrical glow, and yet as one reared in the best culture of, Pro of Prussia, or Kultur of Prussia, I should have not been amazed, for geology and tradition alike tell us of a great transposition in, the, in oceanic and continental areas. What I saw was an extended and elaborate array of ruined edifices, all magnificent hmm, though unclassified architecture and in various stages of preservation, most appeared to be of marble, gleaming whitely in the rays of searchlight, and the general plan was of a large city at the bottom, of a narrow valley with numerous isolated temples, and villas on the steep, steep slopes above. Roofs were fallen and columns were broken, but there still remained an air, in immemorably, oh, sorry, an air of immemorably ancient splendor, which nothing could eff efface. Hmm. <clears throat> Confronted at last with the Atlantis I had formerly deemed largely a myth, I was the most eager of explorers. At the bottom of the valley of a river once had flown, for as I examined the scene more closely, I beheld the remains of stone and marble bridges, and sea walls, and terraces, and embankments once verdant and beautiful. In my enthusiasm, I became nearly as idiotic and sentimental as poor Cleanse. I was very tardy in noticing that the southward current had ceased at last, allowing the U-29 to settle slowly down upon the sunken city as an aeroplane settles upon a town of the upper earth. I was slow, too, in realizing that the school of unusual dolphins had vanished. <clears throat> in about two hours, the boat rested in the paved plaza close to the rocky walls of the valley. On one side, I could view the entire city as it sloped from the plaza down to the old riverbank. On the other side, in startling proximity, I was confronted by the richly ornate and perfect preserved facade of a great building, evidently a temple, hollowed from solid rock. Of the original workmanship of this titanic thing, I can only make conjectures. The facade of immense magnitude apparently covers a continuous hollow recess, for its windows are many and widely distributed. 
In the center yawns a great open door, reached by an impressive flight of steps, and surrounded by exquisite carvings like <clears throat> the figures of, bac of bacchanals in relief. Foremost for, of all the great columns and frieza, both decorated with sculptures of inexpressible beauty, obviously portraying idealized pastoral scenes and processions of priests and priestesses bearing strange ceremonial devices in adoration of a radiant god. The art is of the most phenomenal perfection, largely Hellenic in idea, yet strangely, <clears throat> it's strangely individual. It imparts an impression of terrible antiquity, as though it were the the remotest rather than the immediate ancestor of Greek art. Nor can I doubt that every detail of this massive product was fashioned from the virgin hillside rock of, a, of our planet. It is palpably a part of a valley wall, though how the vast interior was never excavated I cannot imagine. Perhaps a cavern or series of caverns furnished uh, the nucleus. Neither age nor submersion has corroded the pristine grandeur of this awful fane. For fain indeed it must be, and today after thousands of years at rest untarnished and involatile, in, sorry, inviolate, in the endless night and silence of an ocean chasm. <clears throat> I cannot reckon the number of hours I spent gazing at the sunken city with its buildings, arches, statues, and bridges, and the colossal temple with its beauty and mystery. Though I knew <clears throat> that death was near, my curiosity was consuming. And I threw the searchlight's beam about an eager quest. The shaft of light permitted me to learn many details, but refused to show to show anything within the gaping door of the rock hewn uh, rock hewn temple. Hewn rock hewn temple. And after a time, I turned off the current, <clears throat> conscious of the need of drifting, of the need sorry of the need of conserving power. The rays <clears throat> were now perceptibly dimmer than they had been during the past during the weeks of drifting. And if sharpened by the by the coming deprivation of light, my desire to explore the watery secrets grew. I, a German, should be the first to tread these aeon forgotten ways. They kind of he kind of makes us look bad. <clears throat> Here, give me a second. <clears throat> I produced and examined. I produced and examined a deep sea diving suit of joined metal and experimented with the portable light and air regenerator. Though I should have trouble in managing the double hatches alone, I believed I could overcome overcome all obstacles with my scientific skill and actually walk about the dead city in person. On August 16th, 16th I effected an exit from the U-29 and laboriously made my way through the ruined and mud-choked streets of the ancient river. I found no skeletons or other human remains, but gleaned a wealth of archaeological lore from the sculptures and coins. Of this I cannot now speak, save to utter my awe at a culture in the full noon of glory, when cave dwellers roamed Europe, and the Nile flowed unwatched to the sea. Others guided by this manuscript, if it shall ever be found, must unfold the mysteries at which I can only hint. I returned to the boat as my electric batteries grew feeble, resolved to explore the rock temple on the following day. On the 17th, as my impulse to search out the mystery of the temple waxed, still more incessant. A great disappointment befell me, for I found that the materials needed to replenish the portable light had perished in the mutiny of those pigs. In July, my rage was unbounded, yet my German sense forbade me to venture unprepared into an utterly black interior which might prove the lair of some indescribable marine monster or a labyrinth of passages whose windings I might never ex extricate myself. All I could do was turn on the waning searchlight of the U-29, and with its aid, and with its aid, walk up the temple steps and study the exterior carvings. The shaft of light entered the door at an upward angle, and I peered in to see if I could glimpse anything, but all in vain. Not even the roof was visible, and though I took a step or two inside after testing the floor with a staff, I dared not go further. Moreover, for the first time in my life, I experienced the emotion of dread. I began to realize how some of some of poor Cleanse's moods had arisen, for as the temple drew me more and more, I feared its aqueous abysses with a blind <clears throat> and, mourning ter and mounting terror. Returning to the submarine, I turned off the lights and sat thinking in the dark. Electricity must now be saved for emergencies. <clears throat> Saturday the 18th. 
I spent in total darkness, tormented by thoughts and memories that threatened to overcome my German will. Cleanse had gone mad and perished before reaching the sinister remnant of this past unwhol unwholesomely remote, and had advised me to go with him. Was... Was indeed fate preserving my reason, only to draw me irresistibly to an end more horrible and unthinkable than any man dreamed of. Clearly, my nerves were sorely taxed, and I must cast off these impressions of weaker men. I could not sleep Saturday night, and turned on the lights regardless of the future. It was annoying that the electricity should not last out of the air, not last out the air and provisions. I revived my thoughts of euthanasia and examined my automatic pistol. Ter toward morning, I must have dropped asleep with the lights on, for I awoke in darkness yesterday afternoon and find the bat and find the batteries dead. I struck several matches in succession and desperately regretted the improvidence which had cost us long ago to use the few candles we carried. After the fading of the last match I dared to waste, I sat very quietly without a light. As I considered the inevitable end, my mind ran over preceding events, and developed a hitherto dormant impression which would have caused the weaker and more superstitious man to shudder. <clears throat> The head of a radiant god in the, in the sculptures of the rock temple is the same as that carved bit of ivory which the dead sailor brought from the sea, which poor Cleanza carried back into the sea. <clears throat> I was a little dazed by this coincidence, but did not become terrified. It is only the inferior thinker who hastens to explain the singular and complex by the primitive shortcut of supernaturalism. The coincidence was strange, <clears throat> but I was too sound a reasoner to connect circumstances which admit of no logical connection, or to associate in any uncanny fashion the disastrous events which had led from the victory affair to my present plight. <clears throat> Feeling the need of more rest, I took a, sed a sedative and secured some more sleep. My nervous condition was reflected in my dreams where I seemed to hear the cries of, a dr of drowning persons, and to see dead faces pressing against the portholes of the boat, and among the dead faces was the living, mocking face of the youth of the ivory image. I must be careful now, how I, <clears throat> how I record my awaking today, for I am unstrung, and much hallucination is necessarily mixed with the fact. Psychologically, my case is most interesting, and I regret that I cannot be observed scientifically by a competent German authority, Upon opening my eyes for the first sensation, <clears throat> sorry, upon opening my eyes, my first sensation was an overmastering desire to visit the rock temple. A desire which grew every instant, yet which I automatically sought to resist through some emotion of fear which operated in, reverse, in the reverse direction. Next there came to me the impression of light amidst the darkness of dead batteries. And I seemed to see the sort of phosphorescent glow in the water through the porthole which opened towards the temple. This aroused my curiosity, for I knew of no deep sea organism capable of emitting such luminosity. But before I could investigate, there came a third impression which caused its irrationality, sorry, which because of its irrationality caused me to doubt the objectivity of anything my senses might record. It was an oral delusion, a sensation of rhythmic, melodic sound, as some of the wild yet beautiful chant or choral hymn coming from the outside of the absolutely soundproof hull of the U-29, convinced of my psychological and nervous abnormality. I lighted some matches and poured a stiff dose of sodium bromide solution, which seemed to calm me to the extent of dispelling the illusion of sound, but the phosphorescence remained and I had difficulty in it repressing a childish impulse to go to the porthole and seek its source. It was, a horribly re it was horribly realistic, and I could soon distinguish by its, at by, its by its aid the familiar objects around me, as well as the empty sodium bromide glass which I had no longer formal visual impressions in its present location. <clears throat> the last circumstance <clears throat> made me ponder, and I crossed the room and touched the glass. It was indeed the place that, where I had seen it. Now I knew that the light was either real or part of a hallucination so fixed and consistent that I could not hope to dispel it. So abandoning, abandoning all resistance, I ascended the, con the coning tower uh, to look for the luminous agency. <clears throat> 
Might it not actually be another U-boat offering possible rescue? Or possibilities of rescue? It is well that the reader accept nothing which follows as objective truth, for since the events transcend natural law, they are necessarily the subject of unreal creations of my overtaxed mind. When I attain, attained the Coning Tower, I found the sea in general far less luminous than I had expected. There was no animal or vegetable phosphorescence about the city that sloped down the river. <clears throat> uh, sorry. In the city that sloped down the river was invisible in darkness, in blackness. What I did see was not spectacular, no, not grotesque or terrifying, yet it removed my last vestige of trust in my consciousness. For the doors and windows of the undersea temple hewn from the rocky hill were vividly aglow with a flickering radiance as from a mighty altar flame within. Later incidents are chaotic as I stared at the uncannily, li uh, uncannily li lighted door and windows. I became subject to the most extravagant vision, visions so extravagant that I cannot even relate them. I fancied that I discerned objects in the temple objects both stationary and moving, and seemed <clears throat> to hear again the unreal chant that had floated to me when I first awakened, and overall rose thoughts and fears which centered in the youth from the sea and the ivory image whose carvings was duplicated on the frieze and columns of the temple before me. I thought of poor Cleansa, and wondered where his body rested with the image he had carried back into the sea. He had warned me of something, and I had not, and I had not heeded. But he was a soft-headed Heinlander who made who went mad at troubles a Prussian could bear with ease. And we're almost done. <laughs> the rest is very simple. My impulse to visit and enter the temple has now become an inexplicable and imp imperious command, which ultimately cannot be denied. My own German will no longer controls my acts, and volition and volition is henceforward possible only in minor matters. So such madness it was which drove Cleansa to his death, barehanded and unprotected in the ocean. But I am a Prussian, and a man of sense, and I will use the last of what little I have. When the first I saw that I must go, I prepared my diving suit, helmet, and air regenerator for instant donning, and immediately com commenced to write this hurried chronicle in hope that it may someday reach the world. I shall seal the manuscript in a bottle and entrust it to the sea as I leave the U-29 forever. I have no fear, not even from the prophecies of the madman Cleansa, which I, which I, sorry, what I have seen cannot be true, and I know the madness of my own will at most lead only to suffocation when my air is gone. The light in the temple is a sheer delusion, and I shall die calmly, like a German in the black and forgotten depths. This demoniac laughter which I hear as I write comes only from my own weakening brain. So I will carefully don my diving suit and walk up boldly up the steps into that primal shrine, the silent secret of unfathomed waters and uncounted ears. And that's it. And that's the story. It's pretty wild. It shows you, like, how these people just start going insane. They start hallucinating and everything. It's a very interesting scenario, being inside of a U-boat of all things, right? What was this written again? It was 19... Uh, let's see. I think it was 1912? 1920. So I was close. It is a very good story, that's for sure. And it's very interesting as to how it's structured and everything. And of course, the the whole thing is very vague. Because if you know anything about H.P. Lovecraft, well... That's what he writes, basically. He's like, oh, I see this huge thing in front of me, but I cannot describe it to you because you'll go mad. Or in this case, I see a great temple. Here's what I see, but I can't go in yet. It's um, 
it's pretty interesting. It's very fun. Um, H.P. Lovecraft stories are very, very, very interesting. Uh, even if they're short, like this is a short story, but it took me like 30 minutes to get through it, which I wasn't expecting to take that long. I was like, ah, it's like a few paragraphs, it's like 30. We should get through it right away. Nah. Um, <clears throat> but uh, if you haven't read any of his works, I would recommend you check them out. They're all pretty good. But for now, um, let me get, uh, like I said, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the stream here for Subnautica. Give me like a minute or two. I'll update the ticker so that it reads Shin Megami Tensei and everything. And then we'll swap on over. And we'll do like the first hour or so of, of SMT3. Because Nocturne has a kind of a long intro. A little bit. And most of it is going to be dialogue. So if you'll join me for that, give me like, I don't know, a minute. And I'll be right back with you guys. Let me just go ahead and pause the music here. Uh, by the way, it's been a mix of... Uh, of the Donkey Kong, Con Donkey Kong Country soundtrack and uh, the Night of the Woods soundtrack. <clears throat> in case you were interested in as to what uh, was playing in the background. But alright, give me like, I said, like a minute. Let me just update the tracker and everything. I'll be right back. <laughs> 